Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is John Gaspard, author of the Eli Marks Mystery Series. The latest book in the series is The Magic Square, a puzzling magic convention murder. The Eli Marks Mysteries, book number seven. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here. Sure. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, The Magic Square, a puzzling magic convention murder, how would you describe the novel? And also, how would you describe the Eli Marks mystery series? Sure. Uh, the Eli Marks series is currently seven books long. It's a what's referred to as a cozy mystery because most of the violence happens uh, off screen. It's uh, a light, humorous mystery. Uh about a magician named Eli Marks, who lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He's in his early 30s. He was raised by an uncle who was a master magician and who owns a magic store in Minneapolis. And Eli's decided to try to make his living as a magician, doing trade shows and birthday parties and corporate events and that sort of thing. Uh, he occasionally stumbles into uh, a murderous situation where he is sometimes uh, the prime suspect, or he knows a prime suspect, or something happened right in front of him, and he's the prime witness on it. The seventh book in the series, The Magic Square, follows him to a magic convention. I don't know how many people know about magic conventions, but they're quite, uh, there's, there's a lot of them, uh, where magicians, both professional and amateur, gather together for three or four days at a hotel in a city somewhere. And they uh, have lectures where they learn uh, all about their craft and there are shows where they get to see some of the top performers in the world. And in this particular instance, the Magic Square, uh, Eli has gone to the convention with his Uncle Harry, who is uh, in his 80s and has been a magician for probably 60 or more years. He has just published a uh, two-volume set of all of his work. And so he's there at the convention to sell that. And he's brought along his friend Abe Ackerman who is a mentalist. Uh, on the very first day, there is a competitor to Abe who shows up. They've had a lifelong rivalry. And a few hours later, that guy is dead. And uh, Eli is charged by his uncle with uh, getting their friend Abe out of jail and home before the convention ends in three days. So it is uh, a mystery, but it also gives readers kind of an inside look at what it's like to attend one of those conventions if uh, if you enjoy magic, uh, you will enjoy the inside jokes. If you are intrigued but not really a magic person, uh, I think you'll come for the mystery and stay for the humor. And do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing the Eli Marks series? Sure. I had uh, written a standalone mystery called The Ripperologists about uh, people who are intensely knowledgeable on Jack the Ripper who come together to solve uh, someone's recreating the murders in present day. And uh, in the Ripper community there, uh, one thing that divides people is who they think Jack Ripper was. And in this case, that's a dividing line between these two people and also how you would try to investigate the case. I enjoyed that process, but I wanted to write something a little lighter. Uh, and I realized that I had a, a, a remarkable number of people in my life who are magicians. Uh, I am not a magician. But I knew more than the average person knows when it comes to having magicians in your life. And I found them to be funny and a little obsessive and sort of fascinating. And I thought, well, that's a really good hook. That's a good uh, starting point for a magician. Uh, but I wanted someone who wasn't perfect, uh, who had flaws. And so I gave him a, an uncle who is kind of perfect, who is sort of a Sherlock Holmes. And uh, Eli isn't that smart and wants to be. So he, in most cases, uh, solves the mystery. In some cases, he solves it wrong and ends up throwing himself more in danger. But I just felt like it was something uh, that would lend itself to a series of books because uh, magic tricks uh, have such great names. So immediately I had a bunch of titles like The Ambitious Card or The Linking Rings or The Miser's Dream. Those are fun titles. And there was a lot of different environments that I could put my magician in, whether it's in the store dealing with customers, or in this case at a convention in the magic square, uh, at a particular high end magic club in the linking rings. Uh, there's just lots of places that magicians show up and, and that would allow him to interact with a lot of different people and, and a lot of suspects in each of the murder cases. I'm curious what resonates with you and interests you about your protagonist, Eli Marks. I'd like Eli because he is so flawed. 
He's not uh, tragically flawed, but he has enough neuroses uh, that uh, he's sympathetic and interesting. For example, in the first book, he uh, is teaching someone how to be a magician. And one of the things that magicians deal with when they're first starting out is guilt, because I don't want to... Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to give anything away here, but sometimes sure. magicians will lie to you when they're doing a <laughs> trick. And so you're required to lie. And he was in working with the student, he's talking about how do you deal with guilt? And at that same time, Eli was feeling kind of guilty about something in his life. So that book was about guilt. Uh, in the second book, he started to have panic attacks uh, about heights and the reasons why he's having panic attacks. So that became sort of a flaw in the third book. A really, really good magician comes to town, and, and Eli feels threatened, not only for his career, but also for his relationship, because the magician who came to town seems to like Eli's girlfriend. So in each instance, there's something going on with Eli uh, above and beyond the mystery that keeps him interesting and, and engaging. Uh, in the most current book, The Magic Square, he is uh, literally trying to decide whether or not he's going to stay in magic, because he's not sure he's really satisfied by it. He's not uh, really get, getting the pleasure out of it that he used to. And so he needs to figure out, do I want to stay or do I want to go? Well, you also write a different mystery series as well. The Como Lake mystery series written under the pseudonym Bobby Raymond. Can you tell us about the Como Lake mysteries? Sure. Um, I wanted to do a second series that was uh, involved a female protagonist. Uh, and I wanted to do it. Uh, from a third person point of view, because all of Eli's stuff is directly first person Eli. And uh, there's certain benefits to that when you're writing, because uh, you are giving the audience exactly what your hero knows and doesn't know. He's not keeping secrets from you. Uh, but there's also certain drawbacks because you really can only examine what he's seeing. Um, so I had a lot of experiences working in community theater as a director. And community theater is a very ripe uh, location for drama in and of itself and comedy in and of itself. And what was nice about it was it gave me a new cast of characters in every book. There's two books so far. I'm working on the third. And each time we've got our main character, who is the executive director of the theater, whose name is Leah. And she's a former actress who now runs this community theater. And there's a couple other people who uh, work at the theater who we always see. But then in each book, there's also a new play that they're doing which involves a new cast of actors, some new crew people and things like that. So it allows you to sort of clear the slate uh, and bring in some new people each time. So you're not going back to the well with the same people over and over. One, one of the issues with Eli Marks uh, is that people love the characters. There's Eli, there's his Uncle Harry, there's Uncle Harry's new wife, Franny. There's Eli's girlfriend, who now his wife, Megan. There's his uh, best friend, Nathan, who's a child's magician. There's Eli's ex-wife, and her uh, new husband, uh, which is a pretty big cast. And then when you uh, add on to that, you need to bring in a lot of other people as suspects for each story. It gets kind of crowded uh, and it's hard to give everybody their due in a book because there's just so many people. <clears throat> so with the Como Lake Players Mysteries, I don't have that problem. I have three or four recurring characters and then every story has an entirely different cast joining them. So you have a, a nice crop of suspects uh, because with the Eli Marks cast, you know, really that no one that you've known before is going to end up being the killer. That just, it, it seems pretty unlikely. But if you have a whole new cast in the Como Lake Players Mysteries, any one of those people could be our killer or could be the next victim. Well, what was your writing journey that led you to writing and publishing your first novel? Well, I had um, done a lot of film writing when I was younger. I got it movie camera when I was in my early teens and started making movies and then started making sound movies. And in order to go out and shoot something and edit it, you needed a script. So I sort of taught myself how to uh, write a script. I did uh, a degree at the university on filmmaking. I took some classes from one of the founders of the American Film Institute on screenwriting and wrote a lot of screenplays, uh, sold some TV stuff, and then produced a lot of stuff myself, a lot of low budget feature films. And so that was my background was screenwriting uh, and producing low budget movies. I also worked in the corporate world as a video producer and writer. And so I wrote a lot of uh, scripts that way. So I had a pretty good ear for dialogue and a pretty good sense of pacing on things. And when I, uh, I got the idea for the Ripperologists, 
like I said, about the two people who are going after modern day Jack the Ripper. Mm -hmm. uh, when the idea came to me, I thought, this doesn't feel like a screenplay. I mean, I, I imagine it would make a fine movie, but it, there was so much interior stuff going on. Uh, I thought I better try this as a novel instead. And I did that and liked it. And I was off and running. That's great. I'm curious, do you still make low budget feature films that you mentioned? Um, I did one a couple of years ago uh, called uh, Ghost Light. And then one after that called The Cookie Project. And those are both, uh, you can find them on Facebook or on IMDb. Uh, I haven't done one lately because it, it uh, well, because of the pandemic, it's really hard to get people sure. together, that <laughs> sort of thing. And it is, uh, a, a, it's a group endeavor that no right. one goes out and makes a movie by themselves. Whereas I can sit down uh, and in my spare time, write a book by myself. So I, I'm able to get more done without having to uh, schedule people and uh, transport people and feed people. <laughs> completely understand. So how do you feel that your filmmaking experiences impacted your novel writing, if at all? Well, it's a great education to write something and then um, shoot it and edit it because you, you learn what you need to get to tell a story and what you, what you don't need. Um, you learn uh, that it's going to be better dramatically to get into a scene as late as possible. So you're not doing a lot of uh, unnecessary work. It also helps to get out of the scene as early as you can. So you're, you're not dragging on. And, and that absolutely ties in to novel writing. I think one of the first pieces of advice I read when I started that process, and I think it was from Larry McMurtry. I hope it was from him. He said, uh, don't write the parts people skip over, which sounds kind of glib until you sit down and start reading your own work and you find yourself skimming. And you go, oh, if I'm, if I'm skimming past this, everyone else is going to skim past this. Uh, and it's the same thing in, in screenwriting. Uh, you don't want to write the stuff that's going to get cut, particularly if you have to shoot it uh, <laughs> and go to all the trouble of doing that. Um, it's, it's really hard in the editing room to cut out a scene that was either expensive or very, very complicated to put together. But when you realize that it's not moving the story, I had uh, a, a wise editor who makes that cut, which is why sometimes film editors don't want to uh, be on the set. They don't want to know how difficult something was. They just want the footage in front of them and they'll tell the story from it. It's much, much easier for me to cut a chapter out of a book uh, that isn't really moving things along or cut six or seven paragraphs here or there. Uh, that's a whole lot easier process than cutting something and it took me you know, a month to set up and two days to shoot. and. Uh, that had a lot of money involved. So it, I learned from the filmmaking process just how to how to get rid of uh, the dead weight easier. Hey, this is Jeff from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Do you know what I love when I'm reading a great new book? A cup of tea. It's such a fun ritual. Settling down with a cup of tea and a new novel that I'm excited to read. Why not treat yourself to a cup of Plum Deluxe Teas? Every loose leaf tea is hand-blended, fresh, using only the best ingredients. From bold black teas to relaxing herbal blends, incredible dessert teas, or fun floral flavors, there's a delicious tea waiting for you. And I'm not making this up. They have a flavor of tea called Reading Nook Blend Black Tea. It's a tea that pairs perfectly with reading, writing, and relaxing. Plum Deluxe is a family-owned business, and they have one of the best selections of delicious, flavorful herbal teas, as well as bold black tea flavors. Visit PlumDeluxe.com slash listen and use the promo code RWP to save 12% on your first order. Tea also makes a great gift. That's plumdeluxe.com slash listen and use the promo code RWP. There's nothing better than enjoying a great cup of tea with a good book. And now you can get your great tea from plumdeluxe.com. 
5G is here, but the big carriers want you to sign a pricey long-term contract to get access. Well, not anymore, because Straight Talk Wireless has rolled out 5G coverage nationwide with deals like our Silver Unlimited plan for just $45 a month and no contract. And get a Samsung Galaxy A32 5G for $249, all on America's best networks. 5G coverage, 5G phones, less money. Straight Talk Wireless, available at Walmart and Walmart.com. 5G-capable device required. Actual availability, coverage, and speed may vary. See terms and conditions at straighttalk.com. So what is your writing process when you're working on one of your new mystery novels? Do you outline the novel extensively or is it more of an organic process for you? Well, it's funny. It depends on the series. For the Eli Marks series, those are pretty tightly outlined for a couple reasons. One, I have to figure out uh, how to work the magic stuff into it, whatever tricks Eli's dealing with at that time or whatever whatever the title trick is, because the, the title trick always plays in to the story in some way or another. Um, and so I, I do a pretty thorough outline of the first two thirds of the book. And then I know the last scene, or I know at least who the killer was and how it's resolved. And then as I'm writing, uh, things change. And so that last third can be a little loosey goosey with the Cumble Lake mystery players. I wanted to try to be, you know, more organic in it. And see if I could do that. And I have for the first two and the third one seems to be working that way where I just, in the case of the first book in that series, acting can be murder. I knew that uh, they were doing the play Arsenic and Old Lace. And I knew that our uh, heroine, Leah, would be giving a tour to a director who was going to perhaps direct a later production. And they'd be on the set of Arsenic and Old Lace. And they'd open up the, the window seat that's always in every production, Arsenic and Old Lace. And there would be a body, in this case, the body of a local critic who would pan the show. That's all I knew going in. Uh, and so I kind of discovered it as Leah did as she moved through the story as to who who the killer was and why he or she was doing it. And th- that's a fun process. It's a little scarier because you're out there without a net. And, you know, the the fear of getting, I don't know, 45,000 words into something and having no idea where you're going. Uh, I don't want to do that. But so far, I've been able to kind of keep ahead of it uh, and and always know what was happening in the next chapter. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Well, I think it's, this is probably a cliche, but I would say don't give up. And the reason I say don't give up is that, you know, when I wrote The Ripperologists, oh, goodness, I probably submitted it to 100 agents. Uh And heard back for maybe three, and then one kind of liked it, but she couldn't do anything with it. And uh, that went around and around for a while. Uh, And then I wrote the first book in the Eli Marks series. uh, And I I got very lucky in that regard because I said, I'm not going to go to agents. I'm going to go right to uh, publishing companies. And I found a small publisher who wanted to do that book. And they did the first couple. And then uh, we parted ways, and I bought back the rights have been Uh, making the books myself from that point on. But it's a long process and it's an easy process to give up on because it's so hard to see the end uh, because you don't exactly know when or where that's going to be. I have the advantage of having made nine or 10 low-budget feature films, which can be a year-long process. Um, And so I'm used to staring down the barrel of something that's going to take a long time to do. And I'm not really intimidated by that anymore, but it can be really, really intimidated to, to go, well, not only do I need to write this novel, which is in and of itself a thing, but then I have to give it out into the world. And whether you're doing that, trying to do it through an agent in a publishing house, a traditional way, or doing it yourself, it's still a lot of work and a lot of time. So uh, I, the thing I keep telling people is, you know, I persevered not for any particular reason of talent, but just because I liked what I was doing and uh, I was doing it more for me than anyone else. And if somebody else didn't like it, that's fine. Cause it's cause I liked it and I just kept going. It's a hard thing to keep doing. And so I'd say just watch out for that and, and keep writing. Great. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Uh, what have I read recently? Um, I've read a couple of mysteries by Anthony Horowitz who has written um, a couple really Really, I guess, dense kinds of cozy mysteries. Uh, the last one actually had an entire mystery novel within the novel. So you 
read half of the book and then you read the book that one of the characters was writing and then you read the second half of the book. Uh, just deeply convoluted mysteries <laughs> that uh, it's not the sort of thing I can write. I don't have that sort of a puzzle mind. So it it, it drives me a little uh, crazy trying to figure out how how he does that, but he does it so well that uh, it, even though it's something I could never, ever do, um, they're just great. And another new one that came out recently uh, was Richard Osman's uh, The Thursday Murder Club, which was also a, a lot of fun. Um, he's a British uh, TV presenter who has uh, written uh, his first mystery, and I think he has another one called uh, The Man Who Died Twice coming out. Uh, just fun little cozy mysteries. And then I always, you know, I'll revisit uh, if BookBub or somebody has a deal on an Agatha Christie I haven't read. Uh, I will pick that up and look at it just to remind myself of the form. Uh, I've been lucky enough to direct a couple of her plays. And so I can I, I get a better idea of how her mind works when it comes to that sort of thing. But it never hurts to go back and look at the master. Sure. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? The best place to go is uh, elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S mysteries.com. Uh, you'll find all the Eli Marks mysteries there. You'll find uh, a link to the Como Lake Players mysteries. And you'll also find the newest thing we're doing with Eli Marks, which is uh, called Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast. And this is a podcast comes out twice a month uh, over the course of the first season, which is one year. For free, you can listen to the entirety of the first book in the series in audiobook form. That's The Ambitious Card. There's 23 chapters and over 23 episodes. You can hear each chapter for free and binge on them if you like. But in addition to having uh, a chapter every episode, we also have an interview with someone who can give us more background information on something in that chapter. For example, in the first chapter of The Ambitious Card, uh, there's a mentalist who is performing that Eli is watching. And so we had uh, the amazing Kreskin came on our show and talked about mentalism and his career mentalism. Or uh, several chapters in, we meet Uncle Harry and his cronies, all his old buddies who make up a group called the Minneapolis Mystics, which is a bunch of magicians and ventriloquists and variety arts performers. So for that uh, episode, we had Dick Cavett come on. And Dick Cavett is a huge, huge magic fan and had uh, on his TV shows had presented some of the great magicians of the 60s and early 70s, like Sly Dini and Ricky Jay and people like that. So each episode, which is free, uh, contains this short interview of about 10 or 20 minutes, and then you get a full chapter from the book. And again, that's called Behind the Page, the Eli Marks Podcast. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with John Gaspard, author of the Eli Marks Mystery Series, and the Como Lake Mysteries under the name Bobby Raymond. The novels are on sale now, so go buy a copy. And John, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks, Jeff. It's been a lot of fun. Great. That was great. I have spent countless evenings with Abe Ackerman and the other Minneapolis mystics as they talked and drank in the bar next to our magic shop. As a result, I have extensive experience recognizing when Abe or any of the other elderly magicians might have had a few too many and may need a taxi or other form of conveyance to get home. I had recognized Abe was well on his way when we were in the restaurant earlier, but I couldn't immediately tell how much he might have had in the couple of hours since. Calm down, Abe, I said soothingly. I'm sure it's not Gerhardt, and I'm sure whoever it is isn't dead. Let's just go take a look. Abe shook his head and mumbled something incoherent, but obediently followed me as I crossed the corridor to his room. I gently moved the door open, but its tightly coiled door closer immediately pushed back against my effort. So I had to give the door a harder shove than expected before it would allow me into the room. The space was better lit than I thought it would be, based on what I'd seen from across the hall. The fixture over the door wasn't on, but once I got in, I saw the lamp near the bed and the one on the desk were both glowing brightly. There were no bodies immediately visible. In fact, the room looked undisturbed and practically unoccupied. There were two queen beds with Abe's suitcase open on one of them. 
The other bed was neatly made up with the room service breakfast menu still resting atop the pillow. A coat had been tossed over the easy chair. The top of the desk was empty, with the exception of the lamp, a laptop computer, and a worn three-ring binder filled with laminated sheets of hotel information. I took another step into the room and turned to my left. The bathroom light was also on, projecting a harsh blue glare which contrasted with the warm yellow glow of the rest of the room. One glance down at the bathroom floor told me immediately that Abe had been, at the very least, partially correct. A man lay sprawled face down on the floor. His utter stillness and the pool of blood next to his head more than suggested that he was, in fact, pretty dead. Whether or not it was actually Gerhardt was debatable and not really a point worth arguing, at least not at the moment. I scanned the small white-tiled room again just to make sure I was dealing with only one dead body. I recognized volume one of Harry's book, which lay in a heap near the pool of blood. The book looked as battered as the body on the floor. If anyone was searching for a murder weapon, I think I could point them in the right direction. The only other thing which felt out of place in the bathroom other than the bloody dead body was a scrawl near the victim's right hand. It looked like he had quickly written something. I was about to take a step forward for a closer look, and then I stopped. I had once been married for what had felt like a long time to an assistant district attorney in Minneapolis, and so I have some understanding of what you do and don't do in what was obviously a crime scene. I had probably already broken several rules by merely entering the room, but in my defense, I hadn't been entirely certain Abe had been correct when he said Gerhardt was dead in there. In fact, I still wasn't entirely certain it was Gerhardt, although the victim appeared to be the right size and was dressed the same way I'd seen Gerhardt earlier in the evening, but he was lying face down, and so concrete identification would have to wait until the experts arrived. I carefully retraced my steps back to the door, making sure not to touch anything on my way out. I flipped the metal security bar over so that it propped the door open and then stepped back into the hall. At JCPenney's Memorial Day sale, sizzling deals are on with storewide doorbusters all weekend. Or bring home savings up to 50% during our Memorial Day home sale. Save even more with your coupon. And for all former and active military personnel, enjoy an extra 10% off in store. Just show a valid military or VA ID at checkout. Shopping is back. JCPenney. Coupon valid on select styles through 530. Some exclusions apply. Doorbusters valid 526 through 530 and excluded from coupons. See store or jcp.com for details. 5G is here, but the big carriers want you to sign a pricey long-term contract to get access. Well, not anymore, because Straight Talk Wireless has rolled out 5G coverage nationwide with deals like our Silver Unlimited plan for just $45 a month and no contract. And get a Samsung Galaxy A32 5G for $249, all on America's best networks. 5G coverage, 5G phones, less money. Straight Talk Wireless, available at Walmart and Walmart.com. 5G-capable device required. Actual availability, coverage, and speed may vary. See terms and conditions at straighttalk.com.